The year is 1620, 13 years after the very first American settlement sprouted, and the Mayflower, a modest vessel, carries within its wooden belly a group of pioneers, daring enough to envision a life unshackled from the rigid norms of the old world. The ship anchors, marking the beginning of what would become the greatest economic success story of all time. The Plymouth Colony had been established in Massachusetts, but before the Europeans set foot on this vast expanse, the land had its own society. The indigenous communities existed for centuries. The relationship between the realm, rooted in the sustenance and harmony with nature, and the other driven by the insatiable desire for growth and expansion, set the stage for a controversial and bloody narrative. Despite early uncertainties of food, shelter and the lurking danger of Native American raids, birth rates exploded. In 1625, the population was around 2,000. Just 150 years later, the colonies had expanded to an incredible 2.4 million total people. This demographic surge was fueled by a number of factors. In contrast to Europe, a higher birth rate was spurred on by better employment opportunities and the absence of the old world's societal constraints. American families, unshackled from these restraints, grew large, with an average of eight children, doubling the European norm. It was also bolstered by immigration. The promise of a new life and abundant opportunities drew thousands across the Atlantic. The colonial population grew at a staggering annual rate of over 3%, growth that saw numbers doubling every 25 years. Constant population growth became the linchpin, the responsible factor for around three quarters of economic growth. The output of the 13 colonies expanded 12-fold between 1700 and 75, making the colonies' economies around 30% of Britain's at the time. As labour remained in constant high demand, wages improved consistently. This led to early Americans having the highest standard of living in the entire world. Unfortunately, not all inhabitants shared the same experience. From the start of colonization, settlers enslaved indigenous people, eventually setting their sights to Africa. Slavery was a defining and tragic aspect of American society an aspect that could be argued as a primary factory in the creation of the USA we know today. Millions of Africans faced brutal conditions with many perishing during the initial transatlantic journey. Those who did survive were legally classified as chattel and their slavery made hereditary. This was a truly dark time, one that ultimately lay the groundwork for the vast plantation networks that would come to dominate and finance the United States. This was far more prominent in the South, which required an extensive labor force to cultivate agricultural cash crops such as tobacco and cotton. The South boomed thanks to this exploitation. Those who did not own slaves largely relied on subsistence farming. Farmers had to provide for their own families before any other customer. Besides farming, crafting handmade goods was common, with some even trading gold. Slowly but surely, the economy began to develop and diversify. Cities like Boston, New York and Philadelphia became hotbeds of economic activity. Despite this, the majority of Americans still lived outside of cities, around 95% in fact. It is argued this was due to the tight control of the British within cities. The working class distrusted the British powers and preferred the freedoms of the countryside where they could not be reached. This lack of trust built up over the 18th century, eventually leading to breaking point. Year by year, the British ramped up their infringement on American economic freedoms. Tension rose following the Sugar Act of 1764. Heavily in debt from the Seven Years' War, the British needed ways to increase its revenue. The previous Molasses Act failed to bring in any substantial funds due to collection evasion, so the British kept on imposing different tax laws, hoping one would stick. Frustrated by this constant violation of rights, the Americans had enough. The final straw came with the Tea Act of 1773, aimed at forcing the Americans to purchase tea of which tax duties were paid, thus implicitly agreeing to accept Parliament's right of taxation. The Boston Tea Party protested against this by boarding British ships and throwing chests of tea into the Boston Harbour. The intolerable acts followed this to punish American defiance. Tension rapidly escalated, turning to violence. The 13 colonies were now in full conflict with the British. The American Revolution of 1775 had begun. Economic warfare became a powerful weapon, with the Americans boycotting British goods throughout, aiming to drain their revenue sources. The Declaration of Independence in 1776 formalized the colonies' break from British rule, rallying support for the cause. George Washington was pivotal in the creation of 
the United States. He led the Continental Army as Commander-in-Chief, orchestrating the vital victory at the Siege of Yorktown, effectively securing American victory and ending the war. In 1783, the British, along with Founding Fathers John Adams, Benjamin Franklin and John Jay, signed the Treaty of Paris, acknowledging the independence and sovereignty of the 13 colonies. The United States had been formed, comprising Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, Connecticut, Maryland, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Virginia, New York, North Carolina, and Rhode Island. During the Confederation era, the US was merely a loose collection of states with a non-existent overarching government. Each state created its own policies, meaning the federal government were unable to tax, regulate business, or engage in international trade, rendering it useless and broke. They were powerless to pay of its war debts. The majority of the population were experiencing severe economic anxiety. The future was uncertain, and it was clear change was needed for stability to reign. The Northwest Ordinance of 1787 was a beacon of hope. It not only organized the vast territory west of the Appalachians, but set a model for how the United States would grow. It promised freedom of religion, trial by jury, and banned slavery in these new territories. The real turning point arrived later that year, when the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia resulted in the first drafting of a supreme law, the US Constitution. First and foremost, a president was elected, who else but George Washington. The country now had a leader, and the government now had a structure. It had more authority over laws, practices, trade and taxation, and also created a standardized dollar currency. An American school of classical economic thought was put into writing. It centered around liberalism, so individual freedom and free markets achieved utmost importance. It was against monarchs and governments with absolute power, though it recognized the state's role in protecting its own industry. A significant advancement was the establishment of a national bank, crucial for managing national debt and laying the foundation for a unified financial system. In 1803, the US doubled its size through the Louisiana Purchase. Over 800,000 square kilometers of land, stretching from the Northwest Canada border to the Gulf of Mexico, was purchased from France for $15 million. The US suddenly became one of the largest nations in the world, but there was no way yet to link each side. Railroads, an invention originally from England, completely transformed the American landscape. While railroad construction was up to 50% more costly than that of a canal, the investment was justified by the railroad's capacity to carry substantially more traffic, up to 50 times that of canals. The national preference was now clearly rail. In fact, the invention of railroads arguably enabled America's remarkable transition from small-scale industrial production to the establishment of large factories across the nation. Textile production became America's leading industry, driving the development of advanced mechanical devices and machinery. The amount of cotton mills operating were doubling nearly every year. Innovation was found everywhere you looked, but nothing, not trade, transport, nor industry, could have as much impact on growth as sheer population surges. The US total increased from 5 million in 1800 to 10 million in 1820, to 17 million in 1840. Birth rates at the time were extremely high, and the average age was under 20 years. The early 19th century is remembered as perhaps the most prosperous period in early US history. However, as what always seems to happen during periods of extreme growth, the economy will often overheat and crash back down to earth. There was a severe depression between 1818 to 21, caused by a huge fall in commodity prices, but it was the Panic of 37 that perfectly demonstrated the dangers of an overheating economy. This was one of the first economic bubbles to exist, with speculative lending practices and rising land prices causing the market to expand rapidly without legitimate cause. There was no central bank to regulate the matter, and when signs of failure spread publicly, investors panicked. A bank run ensued, causing banks to run out of gold and silver. Nearly half of American banks collapsed. The resulting depression lasted for several years, causing widespread business failure, mass unemployment, and deflation. Ironically, gold itself became the next huge contributor to growth, as it was discovered in California in 1848. The wealth generated by the gold rush was staggering, with tens of billions of today's dollars worth of gold recovered, reinvigorating the entire US economy. As gold seekers, known as 49ers, flocked to California, they encroached on indigenous lands, disrupting traditional ways of life. The influx of settlers led to the seizure of these lands, the destruction of their natural resources, and direct conflicts. This was just a small part of a larger pattern of exploitation and displacement 
One of the more notable events was the Trail of Tears between 1830 to 50. This was the ethnic cleansing of around 60,000 Indians among the five civilized tribes. Expansion continued despite this mistreatment, mainly fueled by the primary Manifest Destiny doctrine. Here, Americans viewed territorial expansion as inevitable and ethical. Various treaties in the 40s, such as the Mexican Cession, gave the US the entire West Coast, admitting states such as Nevada, New Mexico, Arizona, and Utah. Slave labor also continued to increase. In 1860, there were now four million slaves worth a total of three billion. This remained such a prosperous industry in the South, with around 60% of farm value coming only from slave labor. However, resentment towards the practice was growing, especially in the North where slavery was mostly abolished. Tensions were mounting between the North and South, completely dividing the nation. The election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860, on a platform that opposed the expansion of slavery, was the final catalyst. This led to the secession of southern states and the formation of the Confederate States of America, which ultimately sparked the Civil War. Spanning 1861-65, to 65, the American Civil War was one of the most devastating events in United States history, characterized by substantial loss of life, extensive financial costs and widespread destruction. As the less developed and smaller region, the South bore the brunt of the war's physical destruction. Farms, railroads, factories, and cities were devastated, setting back their war effort. They spent around $1 billion to finance their army. Although the Union North spent almost double that, their economy flourished. Their industrialized cities provided the army with supplies and the population with work, so in some ways they aimed to win the war by continuing their industrial transformation. And win they did. The Confederacy collapsed, slavery was abolished with the 13th Amendment, and 4 million enslaved black people were freed. The war-torn nation then entered the Reconstruction era in an attempt to rebuild the country. Despite the end of slavery, Jim Crow laws and growing white supremacy undermined many of the era's advancements. Despite Despite this, the US was entering a significant period of extreme growth. Industry was advancing at an astonishing rate, leading to the second industrial revolution in an era known as the Gilded Age. Over just three decades, income per capita doubled. Oil drove the industrial revolution, providing a consistent and efficient energy source. John D. Rockefeller, attracted by the oil discovery, became a leading figure in the US oil industry. This eventually became a monopolized market, with Rockefeller's company controlling 90% of the nation's oil, making him the richest man in American history, with a net worth of around 2% of the total US GDP. But overall, the country flourished in the late 19th century. Inventions such as electric light, invented by the renowned Thomas Edison, along with the telephone, steam turbine, internal combustion engine, automobile, phonograph, typewriter, and tabulating machine profoundly changed everyday life and industry. By 1895, the US had surpassed Britain as the world leader in manufacturing output, becoming the main industrial powerhouse, and therefore the world's largest superpower. But even in times of prosperity, small businesses found it impossible to compete with the giants Many felt reforms were needed to balance the playing field. These changes kick-started the Progressive Era, an era ranging the 1890s and 1920s, where widespread reforms aimed to remove the problems caused by rapid industrialization and urbanization. Theodore Roosevelt became one of the most popular presidents in history thanks to his aggressive approach to trust-busting. However, it is argued that the core economic problems were never addressed. Wealth inequality continued to increase despite the regulations. While society did improve, the rich would only get richer. The free market simply rewarded those who provided the most value to society. For example, Henry Ford revolutionized the transport industry using mass production techniques to replace horse-drawn carriages with automobiles. The introduction of electric-powered factories led to a significant increase in manufacturing productivity. The year was now 1914. The US was off the back of multiple decades of economic booms. The car industry, along with societal and technological advancements, cemented their spot as the world's greatest power. The first challenge was to navigate World War I. In April 1917, the US Congress declared war on Germany, ending its neutrality. The US rapidly expanded and mobilized over three million men for the war effort. It ended a year later with Allied victory, giving renewed optimism for the Americans, setting the stage for the Roaring Twenties. 
the entire decade was one of extreme economic growth and cultural dynamism. The main driver was perhaps the rapid growth of the pre-mentioned automobile industry. It not only stimulated related industries like oil, glass and road building, but also revolutionized consumer behavior and urban development. As a result, improvements in quality of life were substantial. Housing quality and space per occupant increased. Public health advances were made through better sanitation, water treatment and food safety regulations. A defining law for this era was prohibition. Between 1920 and 33, a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation and sale of alcoholic beverages was enforced. Despite the initial support for prohibition, public sentiment shifted over time as the negative economic and social impacts became apparent and the 18th Amendment was repealed by the 21st Amendment to end prohibition. President Coolidge was one of the influences behind this reversal, who advocated for laissez-faire or smaller government economics throughout the 20s. Another one of his achievements was the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, which granted US citizenships to all Native Americans, marking a somewhat bittersweet conclusion to the tumultuous American-Indian relationship. The Roaring Twenties also became known as the Jazz Age, due to the rising prominence of jazz music, the city of Los Angeles in particular burst into life, aided by the booming Hollywood film industry. More than 80% of the world's film industry was concentrated in LA, generating incredible amounts of revenue for California as a whole. However, as the decade came to a close, the music slowed to a screeching stop. This was the Great Depression of 1929, the worst economic crisis in US history. The Wall Street crash preceded the depression. After years of constant growth and bull market sentiment, most people believed stocks would continue to rise forever. The market had been on a nine-year run that saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average increase in value tenfold. Speculative investing rose, and people were willing to push the risk boundaries far past normal levels, as crashes were basically unheard of. So at the first signs of market failure, people began to panic. This was textbook market psychology at play, euphoria straight to anxiety. The despair phase started when selling pressures caused the market to lose 11% value on October 24th, also known as Black Thursday. The stock market continued to decline over the next three years, reaching its bottom in July 1932. From 1929 to 33, about 40% of all banks went bankrupt, primarily due to substantial losses in investment banking and subsequent bank runs. As people lost their income, industrial production was slashed and international trade fell by more than 50%, meaning corporations lost vast amounts of money. This caused a widespread cutting of jobs. Unemployment rose, especially to young, less skilled men who were let go first. But the situation on the farms was just as worse. As part of the wider deflation, crop prices fell by 60%. There was nowhere to go. By 1932, unemployment soared to 25%. GDP had fallen 15%. Franklin Roosevelt was elected president in 1932 amid the turmoil. He initiated the New Deal, a series of financial programs that attempted to revive the economy. Barely emerging from crisis, the US had to navigate the next great 20th century disruptor. This was probably the largest and most impactful event in world history. Of course, this was the outbreak of World War II. America stayed neutral until Japan attacked Pearl Harbor in 1941. After losing 100,000 US soldiers in the Pacific, they decided to conclude the war with the strategic use of atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, leading to Japan's surrender. This remains the most controversial moment in US history, and just like that, the war ended. The new rebuild era had begun, but this time the US were in a dominant position globally. Most countries accepted the US's new role as the world's policeman, but one fundamentally opposing superpower sought to confront them in what became known as the Cold War. The Soviet Union, previously allied with the US during the war, became enemy number one as soon as the war ended. The US used free market capitalism whereas the Soviets used state-controlled communism. Both believing their systems to be superior, they aimed to spread them around the world, believing the opposing system to be fundamentally evil. The rest of the century was defined by the constant economic chess match between the two, aiming to best each other in innovations and advancements. The period following the war to the mid-70s is known as the golden age of capitalism, thanks to constant spurts of growth, improvements to living standards and new innovations. Incredibly, GDP 
GDP increased from 228 billion in 45 to 1.7 trillion in 75, putting the US economy three times larger than the next largest. If you would like to see the full 75 minute version of this documentary, please check out the link below.